Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a uh, great pr uh, privilege to be back and to be able to talk to my fellow alumni. Uh, I think it's worth noting before I get started, I didn't actually put this in my speech, but considering that he is an uh, SFU alumni and this is all about celebrating alumni, I think it's worth mentioning that the owner of the Vancouver Canucks that are heading to the Stanley Cup is an SFU alumni. So I think that's <laughs> definitely worth celebrating. I don't want to campaign, but if something's worth an outstanding alumni leadership award, <laughs> I'm just saying. He's got some work to do still, right? Let's get to the end, but I'm just saying. Um, I, I put a lot of thought into thinking about you know, what I would want to talk about and what I would want to hear if I was going to listen to a presentation. And the best answer that I could come up with was I'd want to hear how to be awesome. And uh, I have a, a remote, I think. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to muck about, I think the, the easiest rule that I had uh, that I play by all the time in terms of being awesome is to constantly undersell and overperform, right? And this works with everything. This works with your colleagues, this works with your customers, this works with your bosses. Uh, oh, and I, I should mention a disclaimer, Francesco Aquilini was an ex-boss of mine. And for at least one more series, I'm going to regret that decision for the next five weeks or three weeks or whatever it's going to be. Um, but it works with your bosses. It also works with your relationships, right? So any, anything that's people-related, this policy works. And as an example of this, I like to tell a story about what I used to tell my girlfriend the first couple of years that we're dating. She used to always ask me, well, Terry, what do you want to be when you grow up? What are you going to do? And I used to always bug her by saying, well, I think it would be really cool to be the fry guy at McDonald's, <laughs> right? And the reason, and I gave her a really good, long, detailed explanation of why I thought that would be awesome, right? And the reason was is there's like 5,000 of these things. And if I could go to like a random McDonald's and I could optimize that single McDonald's to be the best McDonald's in the entire nation, right, then that was a real achievement. But that didn't really fly for her. But what it did do is it did a really good job of setting the bar really low, <laughs> right? And so when I, you know, graduated from uh, my MBA, and came back and decided that I wanted to start my own business and not take a salary for a year and a half and ask her to pick up the tab when we went out to restaurants for meals, it made me seem reasonably ad uh, adequate. <laughs> uh, which, actually, come to think of it, if I'm going to practice what I preach, I should probably reset, and this presentation should be how to be reasonably ad adequate. <laughs> so at least then I know that I'm going to be able to meet that standard. Um, but seriously, I want to talk about uh, a book that I read recently. It's actually an older book. It came out in 2007 uh, that was entitled The Dip, right? And I don't know if a lot of people in the audience have read it. I see some nodding heads. Uh, but this is one of those books that I read, and I, you know, I just felt like, oh, this guy gets me. You know, like this, this really spoke to me. Um, and the idea is, is, you know, normally average people do average work, right? And as you go up the spectrum and you want results to become good and then exceptional and then you know, the highest achievement, awesome, right? It gets harder and harder to do it. And so on the graph here, you see on the y-axis, we have results, and then on the x-axis, we have effort, right? And most people think this is generally a linear path. I keep trying, I see a little bit of results, I try a little harder, I get more results, right? And, and the thesis of the book, beyond, you know, being awesome is completely underrated, uh, is that it actually follows more of this dip structure, right? And so when you start a task that's hard, uh, in general, you get a lot of rewards, like very quickly, a lot of good positive feedback. But before you can get to that really exceptional stage, there's a lot of negativity and a lot of hard work and a lot of digging, digging in that you have to get through. And so results, actually, they start at a peak, but then they dip down. And it's really only the people that can survive the dip and not quit that are going to get up to those awesomeness results. Okay? And you, you might be thinking, well, what kind of person is good to get through this kind of curve so that they can achieve awesomeness results. And, and it's really a paradox. And, you know, this, admittedly, this slide has nothing to do with what kind of person needs to be to get through the dip. I just like seeing, watching people try to figure out the paradox. It's like, okay, so his nose is going to grow, but it didn't grow, that's a lie. Uh, uh, and your brain explodes. So <laughs> I just think it's a fantastic introduction to a paradox. Um, the, the paradox in this case is really it takes a, a very bipolar type of person. In order to get started and, and, and really start to achieve something really exceptional, you have to have a lot of hubris, right? I am going to do X. And a lot of people, I mean, you're basically painting a target on yourself. A lot of people are going to give you all the reasons why you're not going to achieve that goal, right? You see this when you work out. You see this when you run for office. Uh, you see this in all kinds of circumstances where you're planning on achieving some sort of long-term goal. 
right? Uh, where the paradox comes in is it also takes a great amount of humility, because it takes that hubris to sort of get started and get going, right? But once you get into that dip and you get into hard times, it's the people that understand that they need help. Right? That they don't have all the answers, that they're not going to be able to achieve these exceptional results by themselves, that will have the ability in the long term to fight, claw, and scrape their way out of this dip and therefore approve awesomeness. Okay, so um, I'd like to take uh, a personal example. Okay, so back 12 years ago, I ran for city council when I was 18 years old. I literally I graduated from high school and I ran for city council. Right? So the hubris. Uh, it was pretty obvious. The first thing I did is I wrote a, you know, a big election sign on the side of my dad's house and announced to the world that I was going to run for city council. Um, and that, I, of course, that I was going to win. Right? Now, luckily, this worked out for me, right? and I did get elected. And so there was awesomeness. Right? But this is what I like to call the newspaper view of the world. Right? This is what you always see. This is what you always hear about. This is what you read about in the press. Right? Some kid came out and announced he was going to do something. We don't know whether he's going to get there or not, right? And then, you know, you don't really hear anything for a while. And then if they actually achieve it, you know, you hear about it again. And if they don't achieve it, you, you don't hear about them for very long, right? But the truth, the real news, the actual story that's behind these kind of achievements, right, exists in the dip, right? And so, you know, the truth was, just as, as Julie mentioned in my introduction, right, I didn't have experience. I didn't have any money when I started to run. Right? Everybody thought I was too, run, uh, too young to get elected, and nobody knew who I was. So I had no name recognition. Right? And from a political perspective, right, going into a campaign, that's, that's suicide. Um, but when I got in the dip, right, I didn't give up, I didn't quit, I, tr I doubled down and I tried harder. Right? So I read 20 years worth of newspapers, archives in the, in the library, so that I knew every issue that came up, even issues that occurred before I was born. Uh, I hand painted 44 by 5 foot election signs and put them up myself, right, in my, in my dad's basement, right? It took just a killer amount of time. I walked door to door, I distributed over 30,000 flyers by hand, right? And nobody knows this, right? And this was never reported on in the newspapers, right? But I did the work, right? And that was the reason that I was able to win, right? And that's the reality of that story. And that's the story that nobody ever hears, okay? And so this is where vision comes in. Right? Because when I first took, stood back and I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to run for city council, right? I could see the awesomeness. I could see how cool it would be to represent a group of people and to you know, take on that task and, and give it my best shot. Right? But I also had to examine the work that I expected it was going to take to actually be able to achieve that uh, position and get over all those hurdles that I listed uh, earlier. Right? And now, as a, a CEO of Hire the World and a, a new startup business, right, I have to pay even more attention to this. Because it's not just myself that I have to convince, it's not even a constituency. I have to convince my founding team, my customers, my investors, my employees, my future partners. And if at any time I can't convince them that the awesomeness is worthwhile enough in order to go through all this pain and, 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 and hardship in the dip, then everything falls apart like a house of cards. Right? So what is, what is the higher the world vision? Okay, so my companies that exi exist today we're taking traditional jobs, so think locally, jobs that are normally done in an office, and we're moving them online where they're done globally 24 hours a day, right? And the way that we started was very modest, right? So that's a big picture vision, right? The way that we started was a simple logo contest website, as you can see on the, on the right side, uh, your left, on the left side, right? People put down a couple hundred dollars, they sent the logo that they need, the, the type of logo that they needed, we sent it out to thousands of people around the world, they submitted entries, they picked their best winner, Right? And they get a, a nice logo at a good price. Right? And now we're moving that model into video contests. This is a, a contest just uh, going live. $50,000 contest. Right? A client has put down $50,000 in prize money for people to produce viral videos. Right? Well, that's incremental steps towards improvement. We started with $100, $200 logo contest, and now we're going for $50,000 contest. Right? Well, it'd be easy to sit back and say, OK, well, we're making it, and we're being successful. Right? And the newspaper story that you'll read about, if you ever read about uh, Hire the World, you'll hear that we won first place in New Ventures BC. You'll hear that you know, Oxford University invested in us. We have over 20 employees now. Right? But the truth of it is, is you know, we're in the dip like we've never been before, and we're still going down. Right? We need to cr in order to get this global leadership position, this initial vision that we all outlined and the founding team put forward that they wanted to accomplish, We've got to dig, 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 and we understand that, and we have to keep drilling that 
into everybody's head in our company to make sure that we can come out of this successfully. Now, you might be thinking, okay, so uh, enough about the dip, Terry. You know, we get it, we understand what it is, it's a nice model, the guy wrote a book, I'll go read the book, you can stop talking about it. <laughs> I just wanted to assure you that beyond just this book that was reading, awesomeness is actually backed by science. <laughs> Let me explain what this girl here is doing for a second. Uh, there's a really great TED video, and I'll be, I'll be posting these uh, slides so you can see there's a link in the bottom if you actually want to see it. But there was an experiment done. It was the marshmallow experiment. And what it was done, it was experimenting on the ability for children to delay pleasure. And it was a very simple experiment. Child was, a young child was sat down in front of a marshmallow and was told that, here's a marshmallow here, you can eat it if you want. But if you don't eat it, and we come back in 15 minutes and there's still a marshmallow there, you get two marshmallows. So this girl's in the dip, right? This is, <laughs> she's got intense pain, as you can tell. Uh, but she's taking it, right? She's trying, to, she's trying to get to her two marshmallows. And it, it's actually proven, and I mean, so they followed up on these kids to see where they, they went in their life, and it was highly co correlated to success, right? And so you can, you can actually look at children and see their ability to be able to do this, and then see how that translates into future success by being able to delay pleasure, right? So there's some tests that you can do internally as well. I mean, if, if you're making less than $100,000 a year, and your, you know, and your car's worth more than your annual salary, you might not be a pleasure delayer, right? You might be eating the marshmallow, <laughs> right? Uh, whereas if you're a multimillionaire and you drive a Taurus like Conan O'Brien, you might be able to put up with all the pain and staking agony that it takes to achieve awesomeness and get over the dip. Okay, so now that I, I hope I've convinced you that this is important and this is a, this is a, a concept worth noting, I'm gonna close by giving you five quick tips on how to get over the dip, right? Number one is happiness is awesome, right? And there's two reasons that you need to focus on happiness. Number one, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, wrote a great book called Outliers where he said it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert at anything, right? If you break that down, you take sleep, learning languages, work, everything that you have to do in your life, you can really only be good at 12 things, right? If you take into account that you're gonna have a job, you can be good at two. Right? If you have kids or health issues, you can't be good at anything. <laughs> right? And so it's important that whatever you choose to do, right, you're enjoying it today because you're not going to have time to enjoy it later. Right? The second thing is, is the dip sucks already. Right? Being down, even if you're, no matter what you're doing, being down there and clawing every day, working passionately at what you want to achieve, it's tough. Right? And if you're not enjoying the battle and the grind, you're gonna get beat by somebody who does enjoy it, right? So this is why it's very important to choose something that you're passionate about, right? Tip number two, right? Ignore the hype, right? Ignoring the hype is awesome, right? The, I like to tell people that genuine genius is incredibly rare, incredibly rare. If you meet an actual genius, hang out with that person, take them out to lunch, explore everything that they know. But in general, most people that achieve amazing things work really, really hard. Right? And they specialize in what they do. Okay? And we're a society that likes to pe put people up on pedestals. It's that newspaper approach to the world. Um, and I, I would challenge you to take some of those people off their pedestals. Right? People are like, oh, there will never be another Oprah, right? to name a timely example. No, that's not true. Right? If you wanted to be the next Oprah, you could. You just better start you know, kicking butt and doing it 24 hours a day. Um, the last one is actually a, an outtake from a great book called The Art of Possibility which is rule number six, and it's actually chapter number six in the book, which is don't take yourself too seriously. And this is a big part of ignoring the hype. Because as you start to come out of that dip, or as you start to have some success, right, you need to really make sure you follow that. Um, I think it's really easy for people, once they get to some level of success, to forget where they came from. And, you know, nobody likes that. And, and if you're trying to achieve something, or you've met somebody that's achieved something, and, you know, takes themselves way too seriously, Nobody likes it, right? So please, please take that to heart as well. Um, number three, ownership is awesome, right? I did an economics and business degree when I was at SFU, and the one truism about economics since the dawn of, since they began studying it, is that owners win, right? And why is that? Well, that's because owners have enormous responsibility and they get rewarded for it, right? Anything that happens that stops you on your path to awesomeness, no matter what happens, whether it's a tornado or somebody didn't file a piece of paper or something, you need to own that, you need to take responsibility because nobody can take responsibility for your awesomeness except yourself. 
And all those challenges in the, in, that are in your path, they're coming up for every single other person as well, right? And if you're not able to get over that wall, somebody else with will, and they'll achieve the awesomeness instead. Uh, two left. Teamwork is awesome, right? Number four. Anything that I've achieved in my life that has been worth doing or can even be remotely described as awesomeness has been done because of other people, because I've surrounded myself with great people. I've never been able to achieve anything brilliant on my own. Even that election campaign, there was a whole team that was involved in that. And I think about my business now, and I tried to come up with a list of all the things that I can't do in my business, and it was way too long. I don't have enough time to go over it all. Um, but like, I have a website business. I can't code, right? I have a design business, right? People ask me, you know, what do you think of my logo? And I'm just, the only thing I can come up with is, well, it looks like you need another one. <laughs> Right, so you know you have to you have to make sure that you're you're able to to grow with a team and, and take on the uh, the skills that you you don't necessarily have because you can't be an expert at everything, right? You only got twelve things, twelve things. That's it. Finally, probably the most counterintuitive, failure is awesome, right? And there's two ways to think about this. One, you're not going to be awesome at everything, and sometimes you're going to go into the wrong dip, right? And instead of doubling down, sometimes sometimes course correct and it's time to get out because you're not always going to make the right decisions. The other thing, the other way to think about this statement is that if you do get to that awesomeness level, it's probably because you failed 99 times, right? And this is a quote from the, the owner of Honda and the reason that their motors are so great is because they test and they make it better and they continue to improve and you need to do that over and over and over again. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I personally believe that uh, the true con consequence of buying into a commitment for awesomeness is ongoing happiness. So be awesome. Thank you.